Hello, fab friends of Built Day. We have genre-bending, generation-crossing Kate Miller-Heidke. She lets us in on her new music, Child in Reverse, the album, her wild trip to Eurovision, and has some very sound advice for young and upcoming artists who don't fit the cookie-cutter commercial mold. Check it out. It's got me a good one. Oh, hello, friends. Oof. It has been a minute. A minute of... Cloudy days and a little bit of sunshine, but it is 2020, so everything's a little bit grey. But that's okay because we're going to inject some sunshine into your life because our next guest, well, listening to her music has been described by best-selling author Neil Gaiman as like being fucked by butterflies, which sounds like a really interesting experience. Uh, and I'd have to agree because every time I listen to her tunes, I feel like I've been sucker punched by a unicorn's hoof, but before your imagination goes too wild, I would like to introduce to the build stage, your majesty, the queen, Kate Miller-Heinke. You! <laughs> Howdy! Hi! How are you? Where are you? You're hey, in... what an introduction. Yes! Only the I'm in Melbourne at home. Yep. Yep, yep. Okay, cool. And yeah, it's, you're in Melbourne as well. No, no, we're, I'm in Sydney, so um, it's a little bit different up here than what you guys have got down there, but I think right now you're, you're heading into freedom, so this is good. <laughs> yeah, so now what I'm yeah, telling slowly. is um, the fact that you're on to talk about something really exciting, which is new music and shows. Like, woo! Yeah, I know. I can hardly believe it, actually. But um, this album was finished in January, so before uh, COVID. And yeah, it's a, you know, it's a strange time to be putting out new music. But I think speaking for myself, I've relied on music, you know, in those last seven months more than ever, just for my sanity and just to feel connected and less alone, you know, to feel a bit of hope and comfort. And um, so in that way, I'm kind of glad that this album's coming out now. So it's called Child in Reverse. It's your fifth studio album and it's been six years since you released a pop album, which is uh, super exciting because there's so many beautiful pop elements in there. I mean, you're classically trained. You do pop, opera and folk. But why, was, why did um, pop draw you in for, for this latest release? Oh, I think pop music uh, has always been my kind of eternal flame. It's the constant that I'll keep coming back to, you know, my first and greatest love. I feel so lucky to have been able to dip a toe into different musical worlds. And, you know, yeah, my partner and I writing the lyrics and music for Muriel's Wedding, the musical, that was incredible and a huge project, a huge challenge. And I wrote a children's opera in that time and had a kid uh, which is also quite time consuming but um yeah especially post Eurovision you know that whole crazy experience I just kind of wanted to get back to basics and you know I've got this eternal fascination with trying to craft the perfect pop song and it it can be elusive you know it's not easy it's um not easy to be effective with minimalism um being concise and being lean um, it's what I love about pop music, but it's, um, yeah, it was, it was so much fun getting to, yeah, getting to kind of explore my pop chops again. And, and having the cut through as well, I think is really difficult in these times, but, but considering you finished it in January, would have you, would you have changed anything if you'd been recording it over the period of COVID and lockdown? Well, I mean, I guess I would have had to. In Melbourne, it just wouldn't have been possible. You're not allowed to be in a building with other people. We haven't been allowed to. Um, so that w I guess it would have sounded very different had I had to record it at home. It would have been like a very much garage, <laughs> lo-fi record. Totally. And you probably wouldn't have had the collaboration with More Rat either for Simpatico, which was which is such a, a cool song. Talk me through how that happened. Well, it was just like coincidence and good luck. She was working in the studio downstairs and yeah, we would just 
cross paths in the kitchen, like make tea together or have lunch together. And I was a big fan of hers, obviously. I was a bit scared to ask her to feature on my record because I, I didn't want to be rejected. Um, it's a bit like asking someone on a date, but I just got up the courage one day and knocked on her door and she just said yes straight away and um, came in the next day and knew the song backwards. And, she, you know, she brought her own unique slant to it she's got this amazing musicality and this beautiful nuance of emotion in her voice and she brought something totally new and unexpected to the track fantastic it's it's super cool there's so many raw and um proud moments it feels you can really feel that through the lyrics of some of the songs is there one particular one that really stands out to you oh look it's kind of hard because they're all sort of my babies but um I think You Can't Hurt Me Anymore is definitely one of my favourites. Um, I love that the lyrics are quite, you know, they're quite serious and quite violent in a way, but it's they're overlaid on top of this kind of, yeah, liberated, like, I, I don't want to say joyful, but it's an empowered kind of bed of music. So that song is a bit of a cathartic moment for me. And speaking of children or child, you have an exceptionally cute little human um, that is also quite musical, as I've discovered from the internet. <laughs> uh, yeah, look, he's, he definitely likes attention. Um, he's kind of, a, he's, he's a bit musical, I guess you could say, um, but he's more, I, I think his talents are more in the stand-up comedy <laughs> Realm. Particular song that I really enjoyed of his, um, where there was a confusion between Uranus and Uranus. Yeah, yeah. Look, you, it's it's the, I don't know. Look, it's one of those moments that my husband just managed to capture on film. You know, it's it's rare, but it was a moment of gold. Where and you can see him, his little brain processing the the language lesson, learning the double meaning behind Uranus, and yeah. It's, it's a special thing to watch. What does he think of your music? Is he, is he a fan? Does he kind of understand what you do? He hasn't been a fan in the past. Um, he said my singing makes his ears cry and he, it, like he prefers the limelight himself. He has been to a couple of our gigs. Um, he, he's never liked any of my songs before Little Roots, Little Shoots, which is the most recent one that came out. I think he likes it because there's a bit of fairy tale imagery and he's into the, yeah, the dark forest and the werewolf and stuff. But generally, no, he's not um, in my demographic. <laughs> and did he watch Eurovision then? Because 2019 was, he was, I think 2016 he was born and you did Eurovision in 2019 um, in front of 200 million people. That was dangerous on so many levels. <laughs> yeah. And what, like, how do you approach Eurovision? Oh. Yeah, that that's so right. I've never heard it expressed that way, but yeah, you're right. It was dangerous <laughs> on many levels. Um, public humiliation being a big one and then, yeah, literally probably dying um, if we'd had an equipment <laughs> malfunction. So, yeah, that was, I, I guess after that experience, I was kind of, I felt for a while like I could do anything, you know, nothing really scared me anymore after that. What, like, what, what was the experience like? Like, talk me through the, the story of Eurovision, your story of Eurovision, because it's something that very few people in Australia will ever get to experience. Yeah. Oh, look, I mean, it's nuts. It was absolutely just a whirlwind of craziness. It's everything that you could imagine. <laughs> um, ab absolutely surreal. I mean, I was, yeah, just pinching myself every day. But in terms of my own journey, I, so I, I, um, heard that, you know, Australia Decides was going to be a thing and there was going to be like, a, yeah, an Australian competition to see who um, was going to get to go. And obviously, like, the flame of hope um, was living in my heart when I heard that. And I, so I went off and tried to write a song that I thought would be good for Eurovision. And that was cool as well because I got to kind of 
write the sort of songs that I would never normally write and just sort of thinking about that huge arena and the staging possibilities and how to sort of use the operatic side of my voice in a way that didn't feel sort of shoehorned in or gratuitous, but in a way that was really just dramatic. So yeah, I had a few kind of slight misfires and then eventually wrote Zero Gravity, um, which yeah, I don't think I would have ever written that song were it not for the possibility of going to Eurovision. And then, yeah, after that, working with Strange Fruit, those incredible acrobats on the bendy poles. And so after I, you know, I got through Australia Decides, I then had to enter training with those guys um, over a period of months, just kind of getting comfortable on that pole and getting comfortable, particularly climbing up and climbing down is the most terrifying part of it. Um, Oh, and yeah, it just consumed my life. Basically, my whole life for six or seven months was about this one three-minute pop song. <laughs> and this, the styling, I mean, did you, how much of the creation and creativity did you bring to it in terms of the holistic picture and, um, and approach? Oh, uh, look, that's um, not really my forte like I mean I have opinions obviously but I very much wanted to encourage this to be a collaboration and Paul Clark who runs Eurovision for SBS um, he, it was his idea to bring in Strange Fruit in the first place and he had an incredibly strong vision and sort of guided the process from the start as did Philip Gleason from Strange Fruit who did all the choreography um, and then yeah we just had the most um, exquisite costumes made Stephen Kelly it was very I, I'm a big believer in you know exploiting other people's skills and making it a, a collaboration wow <laughs> well you survived it and it's it's an absolute miracle because it just it showed just what you can do on Eurovision which is just you just boggled everybody's mind so <laughs> So really, in a weird way, it's so iconic to be a part of it. But you did mention before another iconic Australian um, production, which is Muriel's Wedding, which you um, kind of co co wrote the lyrics and and the music for, and you also won five Helpman Awards. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that was a, a huge project. That um, yeah, my so my partner and I wrote the lyrics and music. We worked with PJ Hogan. Um, he wrote the, the script and obviously wrote the original movie and directed it. And that's based on his real life. Um, and a whole range of other incredible people, notably Simon Phillips, the director. Um, he had um, obviously a brilliant cast. But, yeah, that was my first um, musical composition. It's, I've always loved musicals ever since I was a kid. I was sort of like just raised on Julie Andrews and... Yeah, Mary Poppins, The Sound of Music, West Side Story, Sweeney Todd, they're like massive formative influences for me. And I'd always wanted to write a musical, but I never imagined that I would get my hands on such iconic material. Muriel's Wedding's basically a sacred Australian text. And to get to write songs for those characters and that story um, was just a... Uh, a privilege and yeah we were supposed to be taking it to Broadway actually when COVID hit so well that's on hold but hopefully when things um start to open up again we'll be able to take it over there and yeah, wow the the adventure continues god that's <laughs> so much pressure I could imagine but um yeah so well executed and you have um a really strong community online as well you've got lots and lots of followers and they just they really are so passionate about everything you do do they kind of um are they more in the in the opera the folk or what's your community kind of look like because it's quite uh, eclectic yeah oh thanks i think it is i think um you know marketing people at, at labels and that kind of thing have always told me it's a problem you know for me because most successful artists have a sort of bullseye target demographic and then uh, everything else ripples out from that whereas I've never really been able to quantify my audiences and especially when we play live it's it's just a total eclectic mix of people and generations you know entire families will come um 
and I think that's just so lovely. And it, I, I suppose it's also like a function of sort of existing outside of commercial radio, any of that kind of anything that comes along with that. It's I feel like I am more of a kind of a niche artist, and so because of that. I think my fans kind of, especially the ones who have sort of been with me a long time, um, they feel a sense of ownership um, and it's something that, you know, maybe not everyone knows about. And I, I mean, I don't, I don't really know. I, I guess I don't have the best perspective on it, but um, touring has always been such an important part of what I do and I've really stayed connected to my audience um, through that. Do you have any advice for um, young artists that are coming through that that don't fit that cookie cutter mold and that are more like you that kind of they cross genres um, in terms of staying true to themselves or just following you know following their path rather than you know taking um, folding to pressures to external pressures? Hmm, it's a good question, and it's it's hard. I mean it's hard in this business no matter what, but I would say it's a lesson for me that was sort of hard earned actually, because when I first started, I, I did try to conform more. I think, I think I had in my mind an idea of what was acceptable and what wasn't acceptable. And, you know, like say the, the more operatic elements to what I did were occasionally acceptable to be whipped out live, but never, never on record, for instance, um, and I sort of curbed the edges of the more sort of theatrical side to what I do for a while. But I think, yeah, ultimately for me, the lesson was that it, the best thing to do is embrace what makes you different, what makes your music um, strange and unusual. Um, use your toolbox, basically. Get in, don't try to compete with other people but just make something that pleases you yeah totally no i think people appreciate that message and finally you're performing live which will feel like a strange experience after so long tell me about your um upcoming shows yeah so we we're off to um to queensland we've got um some shows at the Fortitude Music Hall, which I've never been to, but I've heard it's an amazing venue, a brand new space. Um, one for the Valley Fiesta, which I, Valley Fiesta, I think it has sold out already, but um, there, are, there are more to come. So stay tuned. Watch this space. And I also did see that you said on your post that um, song requests are welcome. Does that mean just your <laughs> songs or is that any song in <laughs> Oh, look at what did you have a particular, like a cover in mind? Oh my God. Well, oh, yeah. Bit of Slim Shady, maybe. <laughs> um, I feel like Fleetwood Mac is pretty hot right now. You might get some of those as well. I have actually covered Slim Shady by Eminem before. Oh. I've got that in my repertoire, yeah. <laughs> amazing, like, operatic, like, notes. Oh, my God, that would be amazing. Yeah, <laughs> that one's easy. I could whip that up straight away. Um, <laughs> I with Mac probably, too. I, I don't know. I was, I, I, yeah, look, I'll, I'll accept requests for anything. Good. So we're just putting it out there right now and this <laughs> to the deep dark web that you can put in all requests for Kate and um, make sure you go and see her show because uh, it's really exciting that uh, live music is happening again and, and our mm. favourite artists can get back out there and, um, and start celebrating what they do so well. Yeah, I can't wait to go and see some shows myself. I just, I miss sitting in the audience and just losing myself. Yeah, totally. And getting inspired and just feeling that raw energy as well, um, which I'm sure is exactly how amazing your show will be. Thank you so much for chatting, Kate. Um, I cannot to share your incredible new album with all my buddies because I've been a huge fan for so long and um, I hope the shows go really well. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Kate. No worries. Have a good one. We'll catch up. Uh, you too. For your next, for your next studio album. Brilliant. I'll see you then. Look forward to it.